Hello Calculus Kids, welcome back to another lesson in Calculus. This is Mr. Bean, today we're going to talk about something called the Lagrange Error Bound. Hopefully this will be a little bit easier for you because we've already covered the alternating series error bound. So the same idea of error bounds, what that is, is how far off is our approximation from the actual answer. So if you remember in our last lesson, we did these things called Taylor polynomials, and Taylor polynomials are an approximation of the actual function. And so what we're doing today is figuring out what is the error between that approximation and the actual answer. And what could we, what's the maximum that error could be. So that's what today's lesson is focused on. First off, let's take a look at this real quick. So exact value, that would represent the function that we're trying to approximate. So that's going to equal the approximate function, which would be our Taylor polynomial. So I'm going to use a P of X to represent the Taylor polynomial, like from our last lesson. And then if we added some extra stuff, we'll call it a remainder. So the Taylor polynomial plus some extra stuff is going to give you the exact function. Well, another way of looking at this is if we rearrange it and say, what does that remainder equal? We can say that the remainder is equal to subtract the PX from both sides and you get the original function minus the, the Taylor polynomial. When that happens, you get the remainder. So our error is, it's always absolute value. So we say of an nth Taylor polynomial, nth degree, I know it's not, this is the remainder. The remainder is going to equal the absolute value of this thing with the Taylor polynomial to the nth degree or the nth order pay the Taylor polynomial. All right, so that is our error. What we're trying to do today is figure out how can we bound this? What is the largest that this error could possibly be given the information that we're working with for each individual problem? Well, here's how we do this. So I've written out the function. So the function is the Taylor polynomial. You have here the Taylor polynomial stuff. If you don't know what in the world this is, you better go back and watch the last lesson or this lesson will make no sense. So here we have the Taylor polynomial plus the remainder. So that's what we have up here. Taylor polynomial plus the remainder. So what is this remainder? What is that thing? Well, let's, let's just talk about it going to the very next term. So if I could say the n plus one term, so the n plus one derivative of f, right? So this is the third derivative, fourth derivative, the nth derivative. Let's do the n plus one derivative. I don't know how you say that, uh, of some value. So we we're, again, we're doing C there. Um, and then what we'd have x minus c to the n plus one exponent and then all over n plus one factorial. Okay, so that's pretty simple, right? Well, there, there is one trick that's the hardest part to this and that is this thing right here. So what we're trying to do with that is we're trying to, instead of saying the exact value of c, I'm going to change that. If those of you who are taking your notes in pen are going to be upset at me because I just erased. And I'm going to change that to a, uh, a letter Z. Now, it doesn't matter what letter I use. I'm just, I'm just using Z. You can use anything. I think some textbooks use A. Uh, it doesn't really matter. So this is uh, what we're trying to do here is find the maximum of this. What is the maximum possible value of this n plus 1 derivative? on an interval. So I'm using z instead of c because it's not going to be the exact same value of c. It might be something else. So I'll, I'll show you that here in just a little bit as we get through that. So that's the bit of a tricky part. Hopefully the rest of this would make sense. So this remainder the, is going to be at most this right here. So let, that leads us to our Lagrange error bound. So Lagrange error bound is going to be that we have an error between the Taylor polynomial and f of x and the most it can be is this thing here. So that's what I just wrote up above. That's like the remainder it has to be less than or equal to this, where Z is some number between C and X. Okay, so I'll talk about this C and X thing here with some examples. So get this written down and then let's go on and do an example. So with our first example, we've got a fourth degree Maclaurin polynomial. Now, what in the world is that again? Remember, Maclaurin means that we're centering our approximation about x equals zero. So that simplifies things quite a bit for us. So that's where we're centering. Now, I've already given you the Taylor polynomial, so you don't have to figure that out. This is the Taylor polynomial of cosine x. You could go through the steps and verify that it's true, but that is it. Uh, some problems, you won't be given that. And you'll have to figure out what it is. Uh, and then if this polynomial is used to approximate cosine of 0 0.2, what is the Lagrange error? I keep saying Lagrange. It's pronounced Lagrange, but 
my middle name is Legrand, and so I keep seeing this Legrand. I pronounce it wrong because it's close to my middle name. Okay, so um, what am I doing here? This is... Oh, I want to figure out approximation. Now, you don't have to figure out the approximation. I just want to show you that cosine of 0 0.2, we're going to approximate it by using the Taylor polynomial. So I'm going to plug in the Taylor polynomial a 0 0.2. I've already done this on my calculator. And so then that equals 0 0.980067. So this is the approximation of cosine of 0 0.2. Now, my question is, According to the Lagrange error bound, how far off might this approximation be? In other words, what's the bound of, of my error? So we have an error. This isn't exact. But what is the boundary of that error? So see, we don't really, let me, let me talk about this for just a second. We don't actually calculate out r of x. Like we don't try to figure out what is the remainder. We figure out how much could our remainder be off by. That's what we're doing with this lesson. So not actually figuring out the remainder, just what are we off by? So let's use our formula. And that is, we're going to say that R, the fourth order, has to be less than or equal to, and I've got this fraction. On top, I'm going to say the maximum value of something. I'm going to leave this blank. I'm going to put some parentheses here and just leave it blank for a minute. And then I say my x minus c. Well, my x is going to be 0 0.2. That's where we're evaluating. Minus and my c is a 0 because we're approximating at about 0. And then this is to what power? To the n plus 1 power. Well, if this is a 4, then that means this has to be n plus 1. So this will be the fifth power. All right, so now down here, I'm going to have n plus 1 factorial. So it's 5 factorial down there on the bottom. So now what goes right here? What we're doing here is the fifth derivative. So what you have to think through is what is the fifth derivative? Well, f is just cosine of x. The first derivative is negative sine x. And I'm going to keep going down here and show what the rest of these are. So we get all the way down to the fifth derivative, and it is negative sine x. So what I'm going to do here is say that I'm taking the maximum of the fifth derivative. So I'm going to say not, uh, negative sine of, and now what's the value? I do of z, an unknown. So where, what in the world is z? z is some number in between c and x. So let's go back to this. It is some number between z and x. Where do I do here? So I'm going to write down that z is in between c and x, which in this example, it would mean it's in between 0, because that's where we're centered about, 0, and the x value is 0 0.2. So some number between 0 and 0 0.2. So what we're looking for is, what is the maximum value of this right here? So this is the fifth derivative. So from 0 to 0 0.2. Now, technically, I'm doing the absolute value. I didn't put the absolute value on this, so that negative isn't going to even matter. Because if you look back up here, it's the absolute value of that. And here's another trick. So we could just think through this and figure out, okay, well, is 0 bigger? Is 0 0.2 bigger? Is a 0 0.1 bigger? But what College Board will do is when, when you have a sine or a cosine, think about a sine wave or, or a cosine wave. These are, a sine wave or a cosine wave is going to bounce back and forth from a positive one and a negative one, right? Back and forth, back and forth. So this maximum value of this on any given interval, it's never going to be larger than one. So what the College Board will do is they'll just simplify this and make it really easy. The maximum value of a sine or cosine function is just 1, regardless of the interval. So the interval, we could get more specific and narrow it down and get smaller than 1. But for the sake of, of ease, we're just going to use 1. So the error bound might be a little bit larger, but that's okay. Uh, so they, they don't, they don't, you don't have to stress about it. Some textbooks will though. So just be aware of that some textbooks and some problems, they might actually have you figure out, well, what's the 0 0.2 of sine. So for, but for this, uh, we're not going to have to worry about that. We're just going to say the maximum value of a sine or cosine is always going to be one. So this is just one times, and then I have 0 0.2 to the fifth power all over five factorial. And then when we work through that, we are going to get that the error is bounded by, the answer to that is this scientific notation, 2.667 times 10 to the negative 6. Or if we wanted to write this out, we could write this as a decimal. 
which would give us this, a really small number, 0.00002667. Okay, so this represents the boundary of our error. So now let's think about what that means. If we go back up here to our approximation, this is our approximation of cosine of 0 0.2. So it's the Maclaurin polynomial. If we plug it to the fourth degree, we plugged in a 0 0.2 and it gave us this. That's not the exact answer, but it's close to cosine of 0.2. How close is it? That's the Lagrange error bound. The Lagrange error bound tells us that this answer would be off by no more than 0 0.000002. That is awesome. We've got to go over six decimal places. One, two, three, four, five, six decimal places before that digit might be off by two to three uh, digits, two to three points there. That's a really good approximation. So that's what the Lagrange error bound does for us. It, it tells us how much our approximation might be off by. So that's a really good approximation here. All right, let's do another example of Lagrange error bound. So this time we're gonna use the function e to the x. We're centering it about x equals zero, and we're gonna approximate e to the one. So I just wanna show you that e to the one is approximately the third degree po Taylor polynomial with a one plugged in. And what does that equal? That's gonna be one plus one plus one squared over two factorial, which is just two, plus one cubed over three factorial. And so there's my third degree, and then that equals 2.6 repeating, or I just ran it off to seven. All right, so some of you might be wondering, whoa, whoa, Mr. Bean, how'd you do that? Well, if you work through this, you can see that since we're just doing e to the x, if f equals e to the x, its derivative is also e to the x, and its derivative is also e to the x. Whoops, there we go. And so th what we're talking about is as you plug in a zero to every single one of these, well, e to the zero is always going to be one. So every one of these things derivative is one. So that's where the, the, f, the, the derivatives of f, f, f prime, f double prime, f third prime, third derivative, those are always just a one in front. So that, that makes this a little easier. Okay, so this has nothing to do with finding the actual error. This is just the approximation. I just wanted to show you the approximation. So if you know what e is, you know how far that is off. If you know the, what the decimal of e is, well, at least a few decimals. So now let's find the error bound. So I know that my remainder, with the third degree, has to be less than or equal to the maximum of e to the z. And then that's gonna be times by x minus c. So in this case, my x value, I'm approximating e to the one. So that means I'm approximating at x equals one. So that's how I know my x is a one. And then it's about zero, about x equals zero. So that's my c. And then raise that to the what power? Well, it's a three here, so it's n plus one. That's a fourth power right there. And then that's all over four factorial. So the question is, what is this e to the z? So I'm gonna go off here to the side. I'm gonna think about z has to be in between um, what was it from, oh, it's from zero to one, but zero to some X value, the X value I was lo looking at was a one. So what is that going to be? So E to the Z, E is going to be largest when it's raised to the first power. So that lets me now just say that this remainder is bounded by, and this becomes E to the one times one to the fourth power is just one all over four factorial. So then I can figure out that decimal and that leaves me with this long decimal here. So this is the error bound right there. That's my answer. Now, if I wanted to just check it out and see, well, what was the actual, um, actual of E minus my approximation of P sub three of one, which was 2.6667. So E minus that approximation is equal to, so what is the error? The actual error is 0, 0.0. 5, 1, 6, 1, 5, blah, 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 some more decimals. So you can see here that error, the actual error is smaller than the error bound. It has to be. So my error is smaller than the boundary of my error. And so that uh, that works out perfectly. So this error bound is not as small as our first one, but uh, but it tells you like how much this could be off by the, at most. All right, let's just do one more example. So for this problem, we're now trying to work a little bit backwards. We're trying to figure out what is the smallest order. So we're given the Lagrange error bound. We know it has to be less than one, but we don't know what the order of the Taylor polynomial is. So what I've done here is I've just written out a Taylor polynomial for e to the x minus one. Now I do want to point out that the function 
let's use a different color here, red. So the function is equal to e raised to the x minus 1. Now what is its derivative? Its derivative is going to be e to the x minus 1 times the derivative of the inside, which is just 1. So all of the derivatives of this are going to all be the same. Okay, so that's uh, that's an important thing here. And now since we're centered at x equals 1, it's also that also means that the when you plug a 1 in, you're going to get e to the 0, which equals 1. And that's, again, why all of these have a 1 in front of them. Okay, So a lot of times when you're working with these things, they'll often give you problems where it cleans up quite a bit like that. Not every time, but often it will work out that way. All right, so now what do we do with this? We're, let's write out what we know with our long, complicated maximum stuff. So we know the error bound has to be the maximum value of the something derivative. So I'm going to say the f to the n plus 1 derivative. We don't know what that is. Let me rewrite that. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger so you can see that. Okay, so we have the n plus 1 derivative, uh, and then what, of z, with a z plugged in. And then we have times that by x minus 1, because we're centered about 1, right? Yeah, centered about x equals 1. And raise that to the n plus 1 all over n plus 1 factorial. And we know that this error is bounded by 1. It has to be less than 1. We want the error bound to be less than 1. All right, so from here, now we're trying to figure out some stuff here. What is this maximum value? We know the interval is on 0 to 3. They gave us that. So z has to be in between 0 and 3. So which value on 0 to 3 makes the derivative of e to the x minus 1, remember, we're even, it doesn't matter which, which derivative we take. It's always going to be x minus 1. That's the nice thing about this. The derivative will be equivalent, e to the x minus 1. So if we plug in a 3, that would make this the largest. See here, 3. So that would make it e to the 3 minus 1 would be squared. So this thing right here is going to be e squared. So now I can rewrite this as e squared times... Now we've got an x minus 1. So we're doing the x value at 3. It's 3 minus 1 raised to the n plus 1 all over uh, n plus 1 factorial. And when does that less than 1? So one more step of cleaning this up, and then we're going to use a calculator. This is a calculator problem. So what you do here is you then can plug this into a calculator. So my, my idea would be you take this part of it and plug it into like y equals, plug that part in. And you're trying to then use the table. You can use a table of values and just create real quick. So an, an x value and a y value. I have my n and my remainder, x and y. So if my n is a 1, if you plug a 1 in, then you would end up with a remainder of 14.778. So that error of 14.778, that is not less than 1. So let's try. If, what if n was 2? So it would be a second degree Taylor polynomial then my error would be 9.8521. And you just keep doing this. So I'm going to fill this out and show you the rest. And so as you see from here, when we get to n equals 5, we finally get to where the remainder, the error, is less than 1. So that means the answer to this would be the smallest order would be a fifth degree or a fifth order Taylor polynomial. And that would be my answer. So this would be the work that would show you that. And then you'd have to actually use a quick little table of values to figure out when is it going to be less than 1. That's the easiest way to do that. Because you don't have to have a decimal of n. You don't have to know exactly what n equals. It's just it's got to be a term number, right? So it can't be 4.3. It wouldn't be that. You don't want to say when does it equal 1. But just when does it, which term number makes it so that it then drops below 1. Okay, we've covered everything for Lagrange, error bound. So rock that mastery check. And I'll see you back in our next lesson.